G'day, Starlo here. In this podcast episode, I share with you a presentation that I gave at an Ozfish Unlimited Fish Talk Night in Lake Macquarie during winter 2023. I hope you enjoy it, and if you'd like to see the images that I refer to in the talk, you'll find them on my Starlo Gets Real YouTube channel. Thank you so much for that, and, and thanks everyone for turning up on a fairly chilly night. I came all the way up from the far south coast thinking it was going to be warmer up here. Holy smoke, yesterday morning out there with Jono was one of the coldest mornings I've ever had on salt water in Australia. It was cold enough by the mercury, but then you add that 10, 12 knot westerly to it as well and then drive into it, and oh yeah, I was pretty numb. But anyway, it was good, we had a terrific day. I turned 65 last month, it's a bit scary, and I caught my first fish when I was about five years old, so that means I've been fishing for 60 years, which is a daunting amount of time. And the first thing that most of the younger generation say when they hear that is, oh, geez, you were lucky, you got to fish in the good old days. Everyone reckons, you know, the further back you go, the better the fishing must have been. And I think if you could go back far enough, it would be. If you could find a time machine and go back a thousand years, can you imagine? I'd want to take the gear I had today, though, and one of my Lowrance sounders and a boat. But can you imagine what the fishing would have been like back in those days? But as far as the good old days having been in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, I'm not so sure about that. I've got a hunch that for a lot of the fishing that we're doing these days, we're actually living right smack in the middle of the good old days right now. And I know that it's probably going to take a little bit to convince some of you of that. So let's start at the beginning. As I said, I caught my first fish. It would have been 1964. I grew up as the son of a copper and he got uh, transferred all over the state. We lived in a lot of different parts of New South Wales. We were living in Condoblin at the time, which is almost the geographic centre of New South Wales. And my mum won a little rod and reel on a... Remember the old chocolate wheel at the local fete? And she won a little solid fibreglass rod and reel with a closed face. I still remember it. Red reel on top of it. I don't know what brand it was. It was a pretty disreputable bit of gear. But it came pre-rigged with a little frog-coloured wonder wobbler lure. And my mum and dad used to fish but just with a hand line wrapped around a coke bottle a worm and they'd catch uh, silver perch and yellow belly and stuff out of the Lachlan River and my attention span was too short to find it fun to sit there and hold the line and wait for something to eat the worm so I wandered along the bank chucking this wonder wobbler out and I was just fascinated watching this lure come through the water as I reeled it in on the little close space reel and then an amazing thing happened. A redfin about the size of that one, I caught that one just a couple of years ago in a local dam, but a redfin about that big jumped on my little wonder wobbler and I just freaked out. I stopped winding, ran backwards up the bank, dragged the fish flapping up the up through the dirt and I was absolutely hooked. It was the most exciting thing that had ever happened in my five years of life up to that stage. So I was hooked on fishing from that time on and I did a lot of fishing. Unfortunately, I don't have any photos of me as a real little kid fishing because we lost everything in the big floods of the Bega River in 1970-71. So my next shots of me fishing are as probably a 14, 15 year old. And by that stage, we'd moved to Bomaderry, Nowra on the south coast of New South Wales. And I got involved with the local sport fishing club, the Answer Club, and a bunch of guys my age and a bit older. A couple of them were old enough to have their L plates and then their P plates and their first cars and we used to fish the rocks out at Jervis Bay. I went absolutely nuts on that, chasing particularly pelagics, but also things like drummer and brim and groper and all those kind of fish. And we fished a whole bunch of different rock ledges on both the north and the south side of Jervis Bay. That was my stomping ground, and on the weekends, that was where we went. That shot on the left there is a, a spot. It was a big walk to get there, and we actually put that peg in and concreted it in one day, and we used to hang a rope, had a loop in the top of the rope, and hang it down over the cliff and climb down there's no way I could get into any of those sort of spots these days but fantastic memories and great rock fishing in that part of the world used to do a lot of lure casting and a bit of live baiting and things like that and then I really got into the live baiting at a spot called the outer tubes which is inside Jervis Bay a lot of you if you're fishing nuts you'll know about 
this spot you'll have seen probably Phil Atkinson's video, Land Based Addiction and Marlin from the Rocks, those great videos that Phil made in the 90s. Well, this is back even earlier. This is the mid 70s. That shot was taken in about 1974. And they're an old set of torpedo tubes that were put in there during the, uh, the Second World War when they were worried that the Japanese might actually invade and, and come in through the entrance of Jervis Bay. So there was a set on the northern side and another set on the southern side of the entrance of Jervis Bay so they could fire torpedoes and transect the mouth of the bay. There's very little left of them nowadays. Just in the 40 years since then, most of it's rusted away and been vandalised, but there were quite a bit of the torpedo tubes left in those days. It's a remarkable spot. It's a land-based spot, and yet they catch massive tuna, marlin. There have been all kinds of amazing big game fish caught there off the rocks. It's pretty well known right throughout the world as one of the best land-based game fishing spots. And that sort of became my home just about every weekend. I finished high school and, and went to uni and I'd, I was in Sydney during the week and then I'd jump in with a mate and drive down the coast on a Friday night and we'd walk into the Tubes or Big Beecroft or Devil's Gorge or one of those spots on Jervis Bay and fish all weekend. We put in a lot of hours. Uh, we hooked and lost a lot of fish. We were a- mad keen answer fishermen so we were always fishing too light and the kingies used to blow us away all the time. It was pretty rare to get even a kingie that size out on the gear we were using but we did get some nice tuna that's a a long tail we called them northern blues back in those days and finally in 1979 I got lucky and actually got a marlin off the rocks only a little one but uh, I joined a fairly elite club there at that stage then only been about probably about 20 marlin caught off the rocks by 1979 when I got that one nowadays it's it's in the hundreds and there have been some big ones caught off the rocks but it was pretty cool for a a 19 year old to um, to catch a fish like that off the rocks and it was sort of a payoff for all the, the hours that I'd put in out there I guess but I wasn't just doing that land-based game fishing I loved all kinds of fishing I got bitten by the fly bug about that time we were a long way from trout water but I used to fly fish in salt water for things like mullet and tailor and brim and it sowed a bit of a seed of passion that stayed with me forever I still probably rate fly fishing as my absolute favorite form of fishing but I do everything I bait fish I, I fish with green weed for blackfish I fish with soft plastics for brim I've always tried to be an angler who's willing to have a go at absolutely everything and I really enjoy it all too. I don't just sort of specialise in one thing. I finished uni, I trained to be a, a high school teacher and my first posting was to Burke about as far out west in New South Wales as you can get. Because I'd spent four years at uni in the city and I really wasn't enjoying city life all that much and when they asked us to nominate where we wanted to go for our first posting I just said as far away from Sydney as possible and they took me at my word. <laughs> sent me to Burke. I've been there for two weeks and they tried to transfer me to Wilcannia and I said, no, this is far enough out, I'm staying here. It was good fun. I had a great time in Burke. It was a bit too far from the salt water for me, but I got into shooting and hunting and quite a lot of fishing. The fishing out on the Darling River in those days, this is um, 1979-80, it was dominated by carp. The carp plague had arrived just two or three years before I did, unfortunately. The carp had been spreading up through the Murray and then up the Darling and a succession of floods that allowed them to get to Burke a couple of years before I did. And you could just about walk across the river on the back of the carp, as often happens with those exotic pest species. When they first arrive in an area, they absolutely boom and there's massive numbers. And really, we would have caught 50 to 100 carp for every native fish that we caught in those days. It was just completely dominated by carp and sadly it's heading back that way at the moment out in those western rivers after these recent floods the carp numbers have absolutely boomed so I was feeling a bit homesick I was missing the salt water and got pretty sick and tired of fishing for carp so when a a job opportunity came up to become a fledgling deputy editor of a fishing magazine I jumped at it got out of school teaching became assistant editor of Fishing World magazine and Luckily, after about three or four months, my idol, a guy I'd grown up reading his articles, Ron Calcutt, who's the bloke on the, um, on the far right there, and also in the boat, he was the, uh, the publisher and the editor of Fishing World magazine. He actually handed over the reins to me and I became the editor of Fishing World and I did that for about four years. Got to travel around the country and do all sorts of exciting things. Ron often used to say to me that I was a lucky bugger because I arrived on the scene just at the time when fishing magazines were really starting to get quite a big readership and uh, good advertising and also they were being recognised by tourism organisations not just around Australia but around the world. I'd only been there working for 
for a couple of months and I answered the phone one day and it was a guy with a Canadian accent from the Canadian embassy and he said, have you got a passport? And I said, yeah, I have actually because I'd, I'd done my first overseas trip the previous year while I was at uni and actually gone to New Guinea and done a bit of a hiking trip around New Guinea. I said, I've got a, yeah, I've got a current passport. He said, well, how would you like to fish for giant bluefin tuna in Canada? And I said, when? He said, next Wednesday. <laughs> So I packed my bags, jumped on the plane and took off and we went to Prince Edward Island in Nova Scotia on the eastern seaboard of Canada. Myself and 21 other magazine editors from around the world. I was 21, I might have just turned 22 at the time and I was by far the youngest of the 23 editors that were there. We fished for um, oh, about 10 days. It was pretty tough fishing, tough conditions. There was only one other tuna caught while I was there. The run was really in dire straits in those days. Part of that whole thing about the good old days, that bluefin tuna run had completely crashed. It had been overfished. The only fish that were left were a few giants. They were too big to be held on long line gear, so they were only being caught on rod and reel. And really, we were there, even though we were clients for a charter boat fishery, we were there really to fight the fish and bring them in so that the commercial crew could take them uh, and they were sent off a sashimi the next day to Tokyo. Anyway, to cut a long story short, on the second last day, I hooked that. Um, an Atlantic bluefin tuna that weighed 1,020 pounds and uh, I won the competition. <laughs> it's the biggest fish I've ever caught in my life at 22 years of age and I'll never catch a bigger one. I don't really want to catch a bigger one. It was the scariest thing to be attached to that fish on 130 pound game tackle. Two or three times it literally nearly tore me out of the chair and into the water. Uh, they're just a, an amazing animal. What was the fight time? Uh, uh, 45 minutes, not, not all that long because we're in very shallow water. The water there is only about 120 feet deep, whatever that is in metres. So the fish just do these big screaming long runs and then you chase them. But they fish with really stiff drags. We had 45 pounder drag on the reel and to hear that line crackle off that reel under that much pressure was just the most amazing thing. So I, I peaked early as a fisherman. It's all been downhill since then. <laughs> Anyway, I actually ended up, after that trip to Canada, I ended up moving to Canada for a year. I did a, a couple of other trips to Canada, loved the place, dragged my young family over there, and we lived for a year in Canada, and I was the editor of a fishing magazine over there. But it was too bloody cold. The winters are so long. So... I came back to Australia and ended up getting an invite to appear on the Rex Hunt Show with Rex and that led to a decade of being a co-presenter on the Rex Hunt Show which was a, an absolute amazing trip. We travelled all over the world. Rex, he's a larger than life character. Uh, what you see on the screen is very much what he's like in real life and it was quite an experience to travel the world with him and the crew. It also, of course, hooked me up with Bushy and I'll talk about that in a second but I was writing books and stuff at the time as well. I've written about 15 or 20 fishing books over the years trying to sort of eke a living as a freelance I'd left fishing world back in 84 and gone out on my own so writing books and magazine articles and things like that and then the squidgy phenomenon came along so working with Rex I got to work with Bushy in fact I worked with Bushy a lot more than I worked with Rex he'd send us off to locations and we'd do stories on our own and we had an absolute ball People ask me who's the best fisherman I've ever met in my life. I don't have any hesitation in naming Bushy as that person. He's just one of the most phenomenal anglers I've ever fished with. And we were getting hooked on soft plastics. I mean, soft plastics have been around for a long time, but we had all that wonderful finesse gear, the fine braided lines and the graphite rods, really good spin reels and all this finesse gear. And little hard-bodied lures were great, and we were catching a lot of brim on them. This was when brim were being turned from a bread and butter fish into a sport fish, and we were at the leading edge of that, and we were loving it, and we were fishing the tournaments and everything. And then we started catching them on soft plastics. But you just couldn't get the right soft plastics in Australia to do it. Most of the, what we had here were hand me downs from the American market. They were too big. There wasn't enough finesse in them to catch brim consistently. Any of you remember the old, I think they're called bucket of bait, and it was a bucket of soft plastics. They were about $9 in those days, which was a bit more money than it is now. And we'd buy these things and dig through them, and most of it was crap. It was plastic lizards and salamanders and frogs and stuff. We didn't know how to use any of that. But there'd be a couple of little curly tails in there, little pink curly tails, and we were catching brim on them. And we were both sponsored anglers by Shimano at the time, and the, the then boss of Shimano, John Dunphy, came to us and said, look, you blokes have gone mad on these soft plastics. Why don't you design some for us? and we'll sell them in Australia and that's how the whole squidgies thing started so Bushy and I sat down and we drew exactly what we wanted as soft plastics and they sent it off to the factories in China and we got the prototypes back we looked absolutely nothing like what we'd sent over 
<laughs> we'd tell them they were crazy and they looked like goldfish and stuff. And eventually we got it right and we ended up with a range of squidgies and, yeah, the rest, as they say, is history. And we both travelled around the country doing squidgy nights and uh, presentations and things and teaching people how to use them. And it was a great few years. I mean, squidgies sort of owned the Australian market there for the first 10 years of the soft plastic revolution and it was really cool. I always remember the one we did in Hobart in Tasmania and we flew in and we did this squidgy night and it was a big audience and most of them were pretty sceptical. You know, oh, I'm not going to catch fish on these little rubber things. You know, they all use pilchards and bait and squid and everything. And we went back a year later and the same blokes are coming up to us and showing the photos of all the fish they've caught on the squidgies. That was a real buzz to see it really change the face of Australian fishing. Yeah, it was, uh, it was quite a ride being involved in the squidgies. But I always tried to sort of keep doing a lot of other stuff as well, you know, whether it be beach fishing for jewies or catching brim on bait or... I've always loved my rock fishing and I still do a fair bit of rock fishing. I don't get into some of the places I used to when I was a bit younger, but uh, I do love my rock fishing. All that travel with the Rex Hunt show and everything meant that I saw very little of my two kids as they grew up and I think it really probably ended up costing me my first marriage even though it was a wonderful time of my life and I got to travel all over, over the world and everything. I just wasn't home very much. So I was single and met this wonderful woman called Jo from Darwin on a squidgy night actually in Darwin. She was a mad keen angler. A squidgy night. Yeah, it sounds interesting, doesn't it? That's what we used to call them. But she had a, a little girl, a little daughter from her previous marriage and her daughter was interested in fishing but the only kinds of fishing she was interested in was soft plastic fishing. So cut a long story short, she brought her daughter along and we met and fell in love and I ended up moving to Darwin for three years to live with them. Uh, we got married in the Cook Islands with fly rod in hand and chasing bonefish on the flats in the Cook Islands and Aitutaki. That was our wedding and honeymoon. We eloped and did that. If you ever get a chance to go to Aitutaki, it's just paradise on earth. It really is. I'd love to get back there. And Jo, as I said, had been quite a keen fisher, but she has absolutely blossomed and started her own Women's Recreational Fishing League. Her aim is to reach parity by 2050. In other words, 50-50 fishermen, women and men by, by 2050. <laughs> I lived in Darwin for three years, as I said, did lots of barra fishing and stuff up there. Absolutely loved Darwin, but I was yearning for my South Coast stuff as well, and it was just a matter of talking the girls into coming back down with me. I brought them down for a few holidays, and they absolutely loved it. We were packing up to leave to move back down to New South Wales when I caught probably the most impressive fish that I caught while I was in Darwin, which is still the world record queen fish on, on fly. It was a, a massive fish that I caught in Darwin Harbour on a fly rod just a couple of weeks before we left. I thought, am I doing the right thing leaving Darwin but anyway while we were up there we also got to visit places like East Timor and fish there and that was all pretty terrific as well. I've always loved my fly fishing as I said and I, and I love my fly fishing for trout. We used to have regular holidays to New Zealand. We've actually started going more to Tasmania in the last couple of years and also fishing a fair bit in the uh, snowy mountains in New South Wales but I do love fly fishing for trout. Also got a little bit addicted to chasing Murray Cod at places like Copeton and that for a couple of years. I'm sort of a bit of a serial enthusiast. I think I get locked into one thing for a couple of years and then move on to something else. Uh, the cod fishing was, was fantastic but hard work work. I'm just about to ha go out and have a, another crack at it for the first time in a couple of years, but I really do enjoy chasing Murray Cod. Flathead and Jewies, we've heard a fair bit about tonight. I chase those a fair bit down in my local estuaries. I'm one of the 10 people in the Churros tagging campaign who's got a, a tagging kit down there. We haven't tagged anywhere near the number of fish that have been tagged up here or even in uh, St George's Basin, but we have a crack. We seem to have a much briefer window of opportunity down there because of the very cold winters. Our best flathead fishing is October, November, December for the big ones, and then we get heaps of smaller ones through the summer months, but I go out and target them during that fairly brief window in late October, November and early December and try and tag a few every year. I've been fortunate enough to have one of my tag fish. In fact, that one that I'm holding there in the photo was recovered about a year later. Someone was asking before about how much they grew. That one only grew, that was, I think it was 82 when I tagged it and about 83.5 when it was recovered. So they slow right down when they get up to that bigger size. But it was pretty cool because that was one of the 19 that was mentioned before that I actually put on the tag card that it was bleeding slightly from the gills. It had swallowed a big swim bait and when I was getting the hooks out, I bumped one of the gill arches and it was actually bleeding from the gills and didn't look all that healthy at all when I let it go. And I wrote that on the tag card. So it was a real buzz to see it recaptured. 
11 months later and it was in really good nick. It had put on weight, grown a, a centimetre and a half. So don't worry too much if you see a little bit of blood coming out of a fish that you, you're releasing. If As long as it swims away, it's got a much better, as I always say, it's got a much better chance back in the water than it has in the esky. So um, don't be afraid to, to do that. And it was really interesting to hear the stories tonight about fish, you know, with hooks down in their guts and cut off the leader and let them go and they still get recovered. So, yeah, they're a bit more resilient than we, uh, than we possibly give them credit for. OK, this slide here is one that I used in a presentation I did last year down in Murray Cod Country. I called that one, These Are The Good Old Days That We're Living In Now. And I, and I used that slide to illustrate the way we tended to think about things like Murray Cod and Yellow Belly back in the 1800s and even well through into the 1900s, into the 70s and 80s even. Murray Cod and Yellow Belly were a fish that were caught mostly on set lines or in fish traps and all sorts of legal and semi-legal ways and most of them were killed and eaten. That has changed dramatically in my lifetime. The whole attitude towards things like our native freshwater fish has changed and that's one of the reasons why I think that the times we're living in now are really really good and there's a lot of positive there's, there's some negatives too and I'll touch on those as well but you know these days we've got fantastic empowerment fisheries for golden perch and Murray cod it pains me to say it but my wife has caught two bigger Murray cod than I have that was a 116 centimetre fish that she caught on a surface lure crack of dawn on Copeton one morning when it was about minus two degrees and to see that thing come up out of the depths and take a lure off the surface was pretty special. She's also no slouch when it comes to catching uh, golden perch or yellow belly. And we love our, um, our cod and yellow belly fishing. You know, when I lived in Burke all those years ago and the river was just full of carp and we hardly caught any cod. And whenever anyone did catch a cod out there in those days, they wouldn't tell you it was that big. They'd tell you it was that big because that's how long they are when they're hanging up on a meat hook in the chiller, you know, <laughs> at, the, at the local pub. They, they're not lengthwise, they're vertical. They all got killed. And it was the same with Big Flathead. I grew up in an era when most caravan parks had a tree where people nailed the head of the big flathead that they caught. They all got killed, they all got eaten, and for that reason I never caught a big flathead until really the 70s or 80s when a few people started letting them go. And nowadays when most of us do the right thing, you've got a much better chance of catching an 80, 85, 90 centimetre flathead today than you did 30 years ago, trust me things are, are definitely on the improve. So there's been a lot of improvements. Um, <clears throat> the younger generation in particular, I'm finding that their attitudes towards fishing are completely different to us. Older generation, they're, they're much more interested in the conservation of, of fish and preservation of fish habitats. So that's another good news story. Things have really changed. You know, the magazines that I used to write for have largely disappeared. Everything's gone online these days. I've had to go online myself. I'm an old dinosaur like me. I've got my own YouTube channel now and I've got Facebook pages pages and Instagram accounts and everything else and there's so much interchange of information out there now on the internet that it can be a good and a bad thing. People that want to do the wrong thing can still find out where the fish are and go and do the wrong thing but I'm increasingly finding that more and more people are doing the right thing. So Yes, there's been some losses. I've seen some fisheries decline in my time. Uh, I watched the inshore yellowfin tuna fishery around Montague Island and the Banks and Bandit Reef and some of those reefs where massive yellowfin tuna used to be caught every April, May, June. I saw that fishery virtually disappear. There's still plenty of yellowfin tuna there now, but you've got to go right out to the continental shelf to catch them most of the time. That inshore run of very big fish just got fished out and it got fished out by recreational and commercial fishermen and the recreationals have got to take a fair bit of the blame for that but on the on the flip side of that I grew up in an era when southern bluefin tuna were virtually unknown on the east coast they used to get a few off Port Lincoln and places like that but the southern bluefin tuna have made a massive comeback and then we're getting them up the east coast again now each year the run seems to be better and better so it's been swings and roundabouts I watched the whole decline of the yellowtail kingfish fishery when the floating fish traps came in and we went from seeing lots and lots of big kingies when I used to fish the rocks as a teenager we were forever getting our fish monstered by big kingies you'd have a bonito on and a 30 kilo kingfish would just emerge out of the depths and take the bonnie off your line and things like that that all disappeared and that fishery crashed when the floating kingfish traps came in then they got rid of those and the kingfish fishery has been rebuilding and rebuilding still got some problems it's a little bit size overfished there's a lot of small ones and not so many big ones but it's on the comeback the stocked empowerment fisheries, you know, I talked about the Murray Cod and the Yellow Belly, bass, 
barramundi up north, Stockton impoundments, those fisheries didn't even exist when I was a young bloke. So those are whole new fisheries that have come along. Sure, they're sustained by hatchery bred put and take fisheries, but they're still part of the overall picture and they're still good news. The flathead I mentioned, the brim, the fact that we now regard brim as a sport fish rather than just a, a harvestable commodity to go out there and catch and eat. And people often choose to let brim go rather than keep them, especially the big breeders. So there's a lot of good news. And of course, one of the best bits of good news is the fact that anglers are focused focusing a lot more on habitat these days. They're thinking about what it is that actually sustains the fish and creates our fisheries. And that's why organisations like Ausfish Unlimited are so important because they're allowing grassroots anglers like you and me to get involved in tree planting and re-snagging and those shellfish reefs and all those kind of things. So I would really strongly encourage you, if you've been thinking about it, to get out there and actually get involved in some of these programs. It really does feel good to go out and spend a day working up a bit of a sweat, getting some dirt under your fingernails and doing something to rebuild fish habitat and as you probably know you can sign up here tonight if you're not already a member of Ausfish Unlimited so seriously consider doing that but my bottom line is that yeah there's been swings and roundabouts there's been losses and gains but overall things seem to be in a bit better shape today to my eye than they were certainly in the 60s and 70s I remember reading an article in National Geographic when I was a kid about someone driving over a river that flowed into the Great Lakes in, in North America on the border of Canada and the US throwing a cigarette out the window and the river caught fire. There was so much petrochemical waste in the river that it caught fire and burnt for several days. The Great Lakes were virtually dead in those days. They were so polluted there were no fish in them. You go to the Great Lakes today, you can go and troll and catch Chinook salmon and steelhead rainbow trout and coho salmon and lake trout and all sorts of other fish. So just because you've lost something at one part of history doesn't mean that you can't rebuild it and repair things. The fish that have come back into Sydney Harbour in my lifetime, Sydney Harbour was fairly badly polluted, very overfished and it's turned around. We've got water quality back now. You've got sharks and kingies and tuna and stuff coming into Sydney Harbour now that just weren't there through the 60s and 70s. So don't get this idea that everything was better 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago because a lot of things are actually better today and we can make them a lot better. As I said, there, there are some bad news stories as well. What's happened in our inland rivers in the last few years with the fish kills, water extraction, all the problems out there and now this massive reboom of carp. The carp have always been a big problem out there but since these last couple of floods their biomass has just dramatically increased. We need to do something about that. So there are, there are certainly bad news stories but there are also lots of good news stories and these days I prefer to look on the positive side and say what can I do to help generate more good news when it comes to fishing and that's why I put my hand up straight away to be an ambassador for uh, Ausfish Unlimited. I'm a huge admirer of what they do and uh, I would strongly recommend all of you to get involved in it. So thank you very much for uh, giving me the time and listening to me and I'll be happy to take some questions.